Welcome to the Explorers Club and Climate Week. My name is John Englander. I've been a member and fellow of the Explorers Club for several decades, since I first carried a flag under the Arctic ice cap in 1985. This is a special event and a special um, time in Earth's history. We're exploring what this planet is like during climate change. It's very appropriate. The world is getting more and more concerned about climate change. And uh, this small panel of four of us are going to um, cover the issues from the broad issue of climate to sea level rise, to what's the effect on a major city as an example, and put it in the context of what do we need to preserve as things change and things submerge. To kick off this panel, I'm asking Mayor Daniela Levine Cava to give us the case of what Miami-Dade County, which includes Miami, the city, is doing as it faces sea level rise and climate change. While dozens or hundreds of cities can claim um, climate change and sea level being a problem, Miami is the number one city in terms of economic assets at risk from rising sea level. So earns a special place. And a lot of people do think of it first and foremost when they think about sea level rise. I'm joined by Dr. Robert Carell, better known as Bob, who's been working on the Arctic and climate change for many decades, going back to the White House under George H.W. Bush, and was involved with creating actually the International Panel on Climate Change, IPCC report that many of you are familiar with. Second um, will be me speaking about sea level rise and the melting ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica. I'm an author about the subject and a recognized expert on sea level, so that's my specialty. And finally, my third friend on this panel is Lisa Craig. Lisa and I met when she was Chief of Historic Preservation for the city of Annapolis, an iconic historic maritime city. And she had me do several events up there and we became friends and now she's relocated back to California, but dealing with climate change and sea level issues from Nantucket to Florida to California. So Lisa will give us some practical but historical perspectives. We appreciate greatly that the mayor has made time in her very busy schedule to be part of this presentation this evening. Without any further ado, Mayor Daniela Levine Cava, Mayor of Miami-Dade County. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Bob, for these illuminating comments. And I do want to acknowledge that we are a community truly on the front lines of global climate crisis. And I want to thank all of you at the Explorers Club for everything you're doing to promote the scientific exploration all around the world uh, in these challenging times and for bringing together this important discussion. Uh, also, I want to acknowledge that my father, Paul Levine, who passed away nearly two weeks ago, sadly, from COVID, uh, was a proud member, lifelong member of the Explorers Club. Over the last two years in Miami-Dade County and communities around the world, we've been forced to confront the worsening impacts of climate change while also battling this unprecedented pandemic. And while these crises may seem unconnected at first glance, a deeper look reveals a significant connection between climate change and public health. In fact, it's nearly impossible to find an issue that is not deeply intertwined with the ultimate impacts of a changing climate from economic equality to affordability to human rights and much more. And whether or not we can properly address this crisis is truly the litmus test that will determine whether we even have the chance to address the rest of these issues. So it is with a great sense of urgency that we're moving forward with comprehensive climate solutions here in Miami-Dade County, where I serve as mayor for the past 10 months. Our county has a unique geology, uh, our communities and our history, living with water, and it requires a unique set of approaches and solutions. There is no single infrastructure project that will answer the sea level rise crisis on its own. And that's why we're, ta we're tailoring 
our approaches to community needs and uh, on a specific neighborhood by neighborhood basis. So that's why my administration rolled out our sea level rise strategy this past February. It lays out five complementary adaptation approaches and we're combining them uh, for address, to address community needs and preferences depending upon the physical landscape. Our first approach is what we call build on fill. That's F-I-L-L. -L. In this approach, infrastructure such as homes, roads, and seawalls could be raised on compacted soil that is mined from other areas that would be the fill, and that would obviously increase the elevation of the land. Our second, build like the Keys, and that would be the Florida Keys uh, approach, takes some of the best practices from our friends in Monroe County and elevates buildings to protect against storm surge and flooding. Our third approach, our third approach calls for us to build on high ground around transit. So this will incorporate infill development and expand green spaces as a part of our ongoing transportation development. And it happens naturally that some of our transit corridors are already built on higher ground. Fourth, we'll expand our greenways and blueways to increase access to the water, create space for more trees and living shorelines, to store and filter water and add transportation options and recreational areas. And then our last approach outlined in the sea level rise strategy is to create blue and green neighborhoods. And we do that by creating space in our communities for water, in, in our yards, on our streets and in our parks, we create rain gardens, uh, with trees, with gravel, shells, and pavers that create a porous pavement. And I am quite excited about this and can't wait for this to be fully actualized in our building uh, here in, in the county. So this approach to managing water helps our neighborhoods to better capture, slow down, and reduce runoff by decreasing flooding. And it will also help us limit water pollution, which has been a very big problem here with Biscayne Bay, our economic engine. Uh, clean water is our uh, essential economic driver, and we have had a bay that has alarmingly been filled with dead fish last summer uh, in the tens of thousands. Uh, this summer, the past week, a much smaller number, but still very alarming from the confluence of pollution, uh, hotter seas, uh, and other uh, uh, infrastructure problems. So all of this will keep our neighborhoods cooler and benefit our overall health. So all in all, the solutions that we're putting forward with this plan are both pragmatic and ambitious, and they recognize the vast scope of all that this challenge uh, we face while ta taking some very tactical steps we know can make a tangible difference. So I'm very proud of the incredible support and buy-in we've had to this plan. We have 34 municipalities in Miami-Dade County, and then the rest of the county is unincorporated. And we've had strong support from all of our cities as well, uh, and our federal and state agency partners. So I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to share this with you. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Now it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, colleague, um, one of the pioneers of climate science as a scientist and engineer with uh, dozens of visits to the Arctic, who has witnessed the changes over the past half century. Bob Carell. Thank you, Tom. It's my pleasure. I wanna open this with some observations that have evolved out of the IPCC most recent report which in many ways is a, a seminal document. Um, there are all kinds of people will have little differences, but the one thing that is absolutely clear, IPCC has arrived at the point where they now in their full report um, have focused on virtually certain to the words attached to a particular thing, sea level rise or changes in the fishery or what have you. And what's remarkable is in their full report, there are 3,949 times 
where the word virtual certain is true. Virtual certainty in the eyes of IPCC is at this 99 to 100 percent probable. So it's a really powerful identification. To put it a little in context, that's that's that particular uh, observation. In the previous one, we only had something like 3,000. If we go back all the way, we had it four times. So there's this evolution in the IPCC, a recognition that we are in a new space, that um, the climate change is unquestionably a product of human behavior. And um, we need to uh, integrate that into our thinking. Um, and it's it shocked me to find out uh, that, that many new parts of the IPCC process that are 99% to 100% virtually certain. I do want to look at some trends and patterns um, and how we how we got here and uh, not to be spend a lot of time on it, but I want to stimulate Q and Q and A, which I think is going to be a part of our enterprise. The first thing I want to talk about is that the IPCC has made it abundantly clear that um, extreme weather is um, virtually certain driven by uh, climate change. It doesn't mean we haven't had um, uh, hurricanes or storms, but what's different is that they're more energetic, much more energy in the system. A 40% increase in hurricanes, um, category three, four, five. They used to be category one and two, or maybe not even a hurricane. So these things are evolving. And I go to the next piece, a diagram, where this change in the character of uh, the climate system, you'll note that in on the on the left, there is a, a picture of the earth and it looks pretty real uh, and pretty stable. Um, and that stability has been there because of the incredible temperature difference between um, the equator and the high north, high north. But what's happened over the last 50 years that difference has become less and less. And so this crazy thing <clears throat> um, that we call a jet stream suddenly has become uh, very unstable. And as many of you know, having watched this sometimes on your TV, um, that thing that used to be a circular thing looked like a sine wave up and down and up and down. And um, there is a image of that process from NASA showing it. I'll give you an example. Um, as John and I live down here, and we had to go to Washington fairly frequently. Um, a flight to Washington for me out of Miami was like a two hour and 40 minute flight. Uh, and we had one of these jet streams all the way down. So it was all the way down below Florida and then headed northward. And with, a, with the uh, diagram, that's easier to see. Um, and the pilot just moved into that very fast affair, moving at roughly 300 miles an hour. And we landed in Washington, DC in one hour and 25 minutes. And that gives you some sense of the power that is vested in these climate systems that are going to give us all the things uh, that you see in there about IRA and every all the other uh, things about droughts and floods and storm surges and how that plays out. And John will talk more about that uh, and, <clears throat> and the sea level, uh, but more importantly, the rising seas uh, construct. So um, I want then to, uh, show you a little map. 
And it's, it, it gives people a sense of the incredible range of temperatures that the Northern Hemisphere face. And uh, they are of the order of 25 degrees centigrade on average, which is a gigantic difference. And in that image, you'll see a lot of controlling factors that are changing the whole weather system, the whole climate system in this particular piece in the North, North Atlantic. So with that, I, I wanna go beyond the extreme weather because we now know climate is now affecting seriously our food supplies, our agricultural productivity, our fishery capacity and the like. And these are because the ocean has become warmer and fish have their comfort zone. And so they decide just simply to move northward into the temperature zone that is their comfort zone. A good example is uh, Judah, Judah's Point in, in Rhode Island for centuries was the largest landings of, of lobsters in the world zero today. The fishermen can't uh, justify doing those hundreds of miles northward to find the lobster that they used to get in their backyard. So these are seemingly complicated, uh, but they're not because each member of the family of life has its comfort zone. We call it optimal temperature. And the, the species finds it and stays there. Um, so I think we got problems on the food front and IPCC came much stronger out to let the world know that we still are a long way from solving the problem, but they have made it absolutely clear. There are new access patterns for natural resources as the Arctic Ocean becomes open. Um, the rising seas are globally at uh, right now, heavily influenced by things in the Arctic, but John will talk more about it. But what I want to just say a few things, there are extraordinary geopolitical implications for this as we try to negotiate a solution out of this for the, um, for the COP in Scotland and, and so on. And IPCC kind of said, we don't have a way to help you all figure out because the knowledge base is there, the assessment of them and the consequences of them are clear. There is a geopolitical there, I fee, a, uh, shall we call it, a um, psychological or political philosophy piece underpinning. And with that background, I'm looking forward to the speakers that follow and uh, with the opportunity to participate in a Q&A session um, because I think that's where some of the rich material will come forth. Thank you, John. Thank you, Bob. You are unique in your ability to help us look at climate change and the Arctic from the big perspective of having been going there for almost 50 years. The planet has already warmed one degree Celsius, 1.2 to be technical, according to the latest IPCC intergovernmental panel on climate change report released just this August. Of course, the target of where we can stop climate change at either 1.5 degrees or two degrees or three degrees or four degrees is an active discussion and nobody knows the answer to that question. We are on the path to three or four degrees Celsius of warming over pre-industrial. Concern about the Arctic, is obvious to, to most that the Arctic sea ice is disappearing. We can be concerned about the polar bear habitat, but the key point from the warming standpoint is to go from white reflective ice and snow to dark blue Arctic ocean, we absorb more heat. It accelerates the warming, the positive feedback loop. As we look at the world, we see green for vegetation, we see brown for um, 
uh, barren areas or parched areas or rock. And we see blue for ocean and we see white for ice. We tend to ignore that generally, but between Greenland and Antarctica, that's the major ice on land, which is potentially going to raise sea level. Antarctica and Greenland hold 98% of the ice on land in the world. From Alaska to Canada, to the Alps, to Kilimanjaro, all of the other ice on land is less than 2%. So the potential for sea level rise really comes down to what happens to Greenland and, and, and Antarctica. There's enough ice in those two places that if it were to all melt, global sea level would rise about 65 meters, about 212 feet. A common misunderstanding is that icebergs add to sea level as they melt. But like ice cubes in a glass, they're about 10% above the surface. Water has that very unique property that just before it freezes, it expands slightly. It becomes a little bit less dense than water. That's why ice floats about 10% above the surface. But it means that as floating ice melts, whether it be an iceberg, a giant iceberg, or a small ice cube, as ice melts, it compresses a little bit, condenses, becomes a little bit smaller in volume, and therefore takes up the same amount of space as the submerged ice. It has no effect on the level of liquid. It's the ice on land depicted here in a glacier and quite easy to visualize that as that glacier moves toward the sea by gravity and calves off into a new iceberg and enters the sea, that's like adding a new ice cube to the glass of water. And that does add to sea level rise. Also melt water from the ice on land, either ice sheets or glaciers will flow to the ocean and that adds to the water level just like pouring more water in the glass the third thing that adds to sea level rise is thermal expansion of seawater as the oceans have warmed 1.2 degrees celsius already and will continue to warm they slightly increase their volume just directly by uh, the warming process the simple physics that warmer water is slightly larger than cooler water in volume and about half of the sea level rise in the last century, which has been about 10 inches, about 20 centimeters, has come from thermal expansion. But the increasing rate of ice melting on land is now changing that proportion. And more of sea level rise is now coming from melting of ice on land rather than thermal expansion of seawater. As I said, we tend to ignore them, but Antarctica and Greenland are these two giant masses of ice on land. Greenland is about the same size as the Eastern United States from Maine to Florida and from the Atlantic to the Mississippi River. It's a rough approximation of the size of Greenland and it's covered by about two miles or three kilometers of ice. If we look back in geologic history, the geologic record, we know that ice ages have been a recurring feature for at least two and a half million years in the recent era. And as the ice sheets melt, sea level rises. And in fact, of course, they, they correlate directly that 20,000 years ago when sea level was about 390 feet, approximately 120 meters lower than present, it began to rise as we went into the warming era and sea level got to the present level about 6,000 years ago, which was approximately the span of recorded human civilization. So it, it's easy to understand why we have trouble believing that sea level will rise greatly. What's interesting is that since we've had records of sea level rise since tide gauges going back to 1880, the rise has been fairly consistent with some bumps in the lines. But as we see here in the full record of the last century, it was averaging 1.7 millimeters a year. That's about a 20th of an inch. Since we've had satellite data shown by the dotted red line, the rate has effectively doubled to 3.3 or 3.4 millimeters a year 
in the last three decades of precise satellite measurements. And in the last decade, from 2009 to 2019, the rate is now approximately 4.8 millimeters a year, another 50% increase. It's this accelerating rate of sea level rise, that the rate of rise is getting faster and faster that should cause us the most concern. We're veering toward what could easily become exponential growth. And the pandemic has taught us, the COVID pandemic has taught us how changes in slope and abrupt changes and accelerations can compound for magnified effects very quickly. This graph of 400,000 years of carbon dioxide in green, global average temperature in red, and blue for ocean level, sea level, shows us that carbon dioxide temperature and sea level have correlated naturally by some simple principles of physics. The four patterns in the red line show the ice age cycles, we're at the warm spot of the, of the natural ice age cycles that happen about every 100,000 years due to orbital variations, the amount of heat we receive from the sun. And surprisingly, temperature or heat will release carbon dioxide from the oceans, but more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will trap more heat in the oceans. So the green and red lines go together. And as the red line moves up and down, warming and cooling, about five degrees Celsius or nine degrees Fahrenheit, sea level changes. And it's quite staggering that the rate of sea level changes up to again, about 400 feet, 120 meters, correlates with the global average temperature changing up to five degrees Celsius or nine degrees Fahrenheit. For those wanting more information, certainly my website, uh, my book, Moving to Higher Ground, may be useful. This is all the work of the Rising Seas Institute and uh, hopefully transition us in this uh, talk this afternoon for the Explorers Club during Climate Week, bridging from the big picture of climate and the Arctic that Bob talked about, following Mayor uh, Daniela Levine Cava's talk about the effects in Miami, of Dade Count, Dade, uh, Miami Dade County, and, um, and now setting the stage for Lisa Craig, who will talk to us about the effects at the local level in different places in the country where in particular, there are historic assets to protect and preserve. That's another interest area of members of the Explorers Club. Thank you. With that, I want to turn it over to the fourth speaker, my friend and colleague, Lisa Craig, who's a professional in the field of historic preservation. We met when she was chief of historic preservation for the really amazing city of Annapolis. And we worked together on trying to educate the city about how they should plan for sea level rise, which is already visible there and at the US Naval Academy, which is based there. So Lisa has gone on, she's moved back to home to California but now does work with different communities and um, sea level rise and climate change is a prime issue. So Lisa, please give us your perspective on climate change and sea level rise and how it hits us in places where we have unique assets to protect. Thanks, John. Uh, I appreciate the introduction and uh, listening to the mayor um, and the remarkable work that she's trying to put into place uh, in Miami-Dade County to deal with this issue of planning for future sea level rise and warming seas. And certainly, John, uh, you've influenced me to do the same. Uh, and the strong work and research of Robert over the years has made a huge difference in my knowledge base and my ability to communicate risk to other communities. Um, maybe somewhat of a surprise to see my backdrop here, but uh, now that I'm in California, it's about climate change and its various impacts around the country. Uh, obviously, <clears throat> what we're seeing in uh, fires going on uh, as we speak the last two months, the Dixie Fire in California uh, has burned almost a million acres of public lands, forests through four different counties. And as part of that, we're losing our cultural heritage. We're losing Native American sites um, that have had traditional 
practices there for centuries. We're losing historic uh, gold rush communities uh, and we're losing small towns and rural areas and recreation spots throughout the state of California and the Pacific Northwest. So climate change is a serious issue. It is a issue of shifting shorelines, but it's also an issue of uh, lost heritage. And that's something I'm gonna be talking a little bit about today. So I'm gonna share my screen here um, so you can see more about what I have been working on over these many years. Um, and yes, indeed, John, our work together uh, began in Annapolis. Uh, I've been influenced by that uh, work to take it to other national landmarks that are at risk throughout the country. So I'll be talking today specifically about work in Nantucket, a place uh, that John, uh, you are well aware of having uh, been at the Vineyard and Martha's Vineyard and nearby uh, for a number of years um, uh, as you summered there. I'll be talking about St. Augustine, Flora, the nation's uh, oldest city actually. And I have to claim that on their behalf. That is not something that belongs to Santa Fe. And then uh, my own community for a number of, of years, Annapolis, Maryland. I'll sit in on a few other communities and projects coming up where we're really looking at this issue of resilience planning at a very localized level. We heard so much about the big issues and concerns of Miami-Dade County. We heard about uh, the Arctic. We heard about how these issues are going to be facing us in an uh, uh, accelerating way down in the future. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the places that have mattered to me and where I've been able to hopefully uh, make a difference in planning for greater resilience uh, and reducing the impacts of climate change on historic and cultural assets. This is Annap Annapolis, Maryland, uh, a view from the late 19th century, a colonial city established in the late 17th century. Uh, this is a case study in hazard mitigation planning for that community. And hazard mitigation plans are a tool by which we can help communities um, assess risks as well as plan for those risks to be better prepared. Um, we found out in uh, 2013 that Annapolis actually had the largest increase nationwide in nuisance flooding uh, of any city in the country at that point. Uh, I think that's since been taken on by Charleston. But at that time, we learned that over the past 50 years, we had increased our flooding, our tidal flooding, uh, king tides, uh, sunny day flooding, whatever you want to call it, to uh, from four days uh, a year to 40 days with projections that by 2065, tidal flooding would occur um, more than once a day. This information was developed uh, by NOAA through their reports and then publicized uh, by another good uh, cooperating partner of ours, the Union of Concerned Scientists, who didn't just put out one publication talking about landmarks at risk in 2014. And we see the Castillo de San Marco uh, lit, uh, illustrated there, um, but also another publication about encroaching tides and what communities were dealing with in that regard. As you can see on the far left, uh, that's a sculpture of Alex Haley, um, the author of Roots, and it is meant to basically honor um, uh, Kunta Kinte, and recognize the fact that uh, this was the location for slave ships to come. And so he is there sitting at the city dock. Unfortunately, he's become our um, gauge for flooding in the city of Annapolis and Hurricane uh, Isabel actually covered his head. So 11.7 feet uh, of storm surge um, is something that we can anticipate increasing in the future. And this is where John actually came and sp spent uh, three full days. We took him on a lecture circuit. He met uh, on the far left with uh, members of the United States Naval Academy's um, architecture and engineering programs, along with our good friend, Don Bain. And we toured the Academy. We learned uh, how our sister National Historic Landmark, we do share a jurisdictional line, uh, but we also share a shoreline. And, uh, you know, sea level rise knows no jurisdictional boundaries. So we met with them, John and Don both talked with them and learned about their plans. 
Um, he also went on the radio. Uh, rock stations are a great place, apparently, for John to talk about sea level rise. So anyone out there that wants to invite John to come and get on the radio, hey, those people were really tuned in because the next night we had almost 600 people show up at a local college auditorium to hear about the future of Annapolis, the future of sea level rise, and what we might be able to do to basically plan for, prepare our community, increase resilience to our downtown historic district. Um, as a public-private partnership, we had 32 member organizations. It took almost four years, but because we had this model planning guide from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, we ab were able to develop a plan from soup to nuts. We were the first FEMA-approved cultural resource hazard mitigation, uh, hazard adaptation plan, as I like to call it, because it is about adapting uh, to these issues of extreme storm events and, and tidal flooding. So we had that in place, and it was a, an important community awareness building project that led me to other places. Um, you saw the report uh, with Castillo on it. Uh, St. Augustine actually developed a initiative called Resilient Heritage in the Nation's old, Oldest City. So we took some of the lessons we learned in community engagement and community value assessments. What places really matter? What are the places people want to ensure are protected? Obviously, the Plaza de la Castione is in the center of um, uh, St. Augustine. And so that was a place that mattered, but we needed to do surveys. We needed to do workshops. We needed to understand not all historic places are equally prioritized when you are doing an adaptation planning. We can't save it all. So what are we going to say? What are we going to prioritize in recovery when major events do happen? The community came together and they picked their top 10. And these were the places. And some of these places were not the grand monuments. Some of these, for example, the Lincolnville Historic District, traditionally an African-American historic district, a very vulnerable population when it comes to sea level rise and major storm events. And so we really were able to work with the community to identify those places of greatest value so that they could move forward with planning for a what we looked at as a 30 year, that all important mortgage cycle that John taught me about uh, how do we plan for 30 years of sea level rise in the future. We then moved on to Nantucket. These were people that I had worked with before through the University of Florida. They have a preservation institute in Nantucket. Um, I came in and conducted a workshop with the University of Florida to again, understand the issues of community value for their heritage and the places that contribute to the local economy. A very important thing to understand is that many of these historic landmark communities rely on heritage tourism for their local economy base. So again, we were talking about risk assessment, doing documentation. And in Nantucket, that documentation was conducted via 3D laser scanning and visualization. On the far left, you see the impact to some of the most vulnerable neighborhoods, the areas of Nantucket, Matticut, after a storm a number of years ago, the loss of those particular properties. Sometimes they're second homes, but in places like Matticut, those are the homes of the people who provide the services, who live, who are natives in Nantucket versus second homes. So we hosted a Keeping History Above Water workshop. This is a conference um, format and initiative I've been involved in for at least six or seven years now. Just finished one in Charleston. Anticipate the next one to be in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, but we participated in developing the visualization uh, strategies out of this analysis, this risk assessment. You can see on the top left, uh, the, the Long Wharf area, and on the right, what it would look like uh, in 2040. It wasn't too much further from us than we are today. So it is something that they are dealing with. As a matter of fact, that drove the town to uh, initiate 
a coastal resilience planning effort for the entire National Store Landmark Island. So adaptation strategies will be developed beyond the downtown area for the entire island. Now I'm um, using these same tools, these, these same methods that we employ, uh, apply that is in Annapolis, uh, in St. Augustine and Nantucket in other communities. New Bern is currently working on a resilience and hazard mitigation plan. Uh, I'm working with them, particularly in those areas of the community that are extremely vulnerable. There are neighborhoods that were traditionally settled by African-American families that are at 50% vacancy after Hurricane Florence. How we deal with those areas, with the cultural connections that are still in place, they are neighborhoods that have been around since the founding of New Bern and after the Great Fire of 1922. So how we work with those property owners, with those landlords, with those renters, with those business owners to help them become more resilient is what our goal is now. And then that leads me to the state of Texas. The state of Texas is one of the few states that are actually building disaster resilience into their statewide preservation plan. Uh, an image of Port Arthur, um, Texas, in the bottom right corner, it was hit with a significant amount of rain during uh, Hurricane Harvey. And so we are working with communities like Port Arthur, which have historic districts, which are developing design guidelines to ensure disaster resilience is incorporated and that they are serving as a best practice, as a case study, as small communities must in statewide planning efforts. So we'll be working on that over the next two years to help develop that statewide historic preservation plan with disaster resilience at its heart. And then finally, uh, I was so glad to hear um, the mayor speak of Miami-Dade County and their initiative, their work moving forward, because we are continuing to work with the University of Florida on a number of projects. Again, many of these are the initial risk assessment. What places do we value? What places are at risk? And what are the specific priorities the community has for either preparing those places or recovering them from disasters? So a couple of places that we're gonna be dealing with, we're not just in Florida, although up at that first image of Tarpon Springs, uh, is, uh, as for those of you who may not know, uh, the sponge capital of the world, apparently, maybe outside of Greece. Uh, but the fact is, is that has had a very long and established uh, Greek history um, for having an industry that has survived over 100 plus years. Um, to the historic Deering Estate, actually owned by Miami-Dade County Parks and uh, managed by the historic De uh, Deering Foundation, we'll be working with them to address this community, this landmark property, which is the second most vulnerable of the 140-some historic properties within the Miami-Dade County Parks system. So again, developing strategies, adaptation strategies for both landscapes as well as the properties. And then lastly, on the left there, uh, a site visit. Um, our, our leader there at the University of Florida, Marty Hilton, who has been actually now taken by the National Park Service to serve as the Park Service's first climate change architect, uh, visited uh, Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago. So we'll be doing a resilience plan um, and visualization and a uh, island-wide conference on the issue of water inundation, flooding, and how that uh, uh, island's uh, nation can protect itself and its community in the future. So just a few little places, my travel log and what we've been able to accomplish uh, um, beginning with the work in Annapolis and now going international with our efforts uh, in an island nation. So thanks, John, for, for allowing me to share this story. Oh, great information, Lisa. Thanks for being with us. We've, um, we've all probably run long and we probably could talk for hours about this. This is a, a transformative challenge and uh, none of us knows the path forward. 
I think um, probably just a, a way to wrap this up is uh, for, since the mayor's had to leave early, understood for her obligations, but if Bob, Lisa, and I could just spend a, a couple of minutes um, we, to, um, to think about what will things be like when sea level is a half meter, a foot and a half higher. We don't know when that'll happen, but if we want to think ahead, whether it be 30 years or 50 years, uh, we'll probably not be here personally to, to observe, but kind of an interesting question to think about what will happen as the transformational challenge of sea level rise uh, changes cities all over the world. And it's probably a, a maybe it takes some time to think about, but um, it's something I, I wonder about and uh, would like any, any thoughts. What, what's the transition is going to be like? Are they going to be abrupt? Are they going to be just gradually finding higher ground? Are we going to have to abandon cities wholesale? Any, um, any thoughts? And we'll talk another question or two. Well, John, I mean, my observations have been since I've, I've only been doing this now for almost a decade, that it's a very slow sense of realization. But what happens is places like Charleston, where they find themselves four, five, six, seven inundation events a year, I almost worry about them getting used to it. Oh, so mm. we're walking around in waders. I mean, we all have seen those images of Venice where people know to come with their boots uh, and are prepared for the water rising. I think the challenge is going to be, we are going to lose any kind of um, socioeconomic diversity in our big cities, because as we're seeing many of the properties, the neighborhoods that were developed in the fifties and sixties were constructed in areas where the water used to be. Um, and so those communities flood first. And as the mayor is well aware, that happens in Miami a lot. And it is not a high tax base in those neighborhoods. And because of that, their issues aren't as important as South Beach's issues might be. So um, I think what we're gonna see is just as we've seen with Florence and New Bern, property owners are not going to spend any money renovating properties. They're gonna wait for the city to call them a nuisance um, for those properties to be demolished. And in some respects, it will create the green spaces so by default, we may actually have some areas of green space that will develop um, because neighborhoods are, are lost. I don't mean to be doom and gloom. I think there are plenty of communities that are starting to plan. I guess your question was a good one. What's it going to look like? And how are they moving quickly enough? Yeah. Lisa, um, I'm thrilled that you're a part of this because it's bringing a human dimension to this climate issue that is, is not respected if it comes from, say, a, a business that has got something to sell. What you have, what you have is everybody knows the heritage of our nation, and in fact, all over the world, uh, things have been made to honor humans in our buildings and in our, in our walkways and in our parks. So having you on board, I think is stunning. I, I, I have a dear friend, Angela, who um, went to Greenland uh, on two of our trips and she was so moved um, by it that she was um, a member of Amnesty and her international staff and she began to let the whole Am Amnesty International know that Amnesty is also about protecting the rights and lives of people against whatever challenges there are. And climate had never been on the table. And as a consequence, two weeks ago, she was made the head of all international Amnesty operation worldwide. And it's the same story, telling people that the human side of it, where you have only one goal, and that is to be sure that the heritage of our nation's people, their artwork, their buildings and love, 
uh, uh, we can do our best to protect, even though you said quite properly, we probably can't do it all, but we're gonna have to set some priorities because this is particularly important. Um, sometime when John and you and I and have a, I think I'll get her to join us to see how she sees Amnesty International doing for people what you are doing for our cultural and world heritage. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Thank you, Bob and, and Lisa. I think we've probably exceeded our, our hour at this point, but um, I want to wrap this up by just saying that the Explorers Club which has again been known for people who first to climb Mount Everest and first to be astronauts and first to go to the deepest parts of the ocean and do these different things. But it's appropriate to think about us exploring this new world, the world of a warmer planet with less ice, changing weather patterns, wildfires that we could not have even imagined. It's a new planet and we're all exploring it. We're all trying to communicate it, bring it back to the, uh, populations at large to understand what's happening. The planet's always changed. That's been the nature of it. It's always had things we didn't um, experience and still most of the ocean bottom we, we've not seen, but um, life's been a, you know, one of exploration. We're, new at, we're now in a new era. And I think this, uh, I hope this program helps to stimulate people to think about the fact that um, while we might think that everything on this planet has been explored, we have to explore things again because the planet's changing. And that may help us to reflect and encourage people to take more seriously the changes that are happening in front of us. And as Bob said, the IPCC has um, now determined with uh, 2,900 references that it's virtually certain what's happening and what's causing it. So with that, I wanna thank our panel and thank the Explorers Club for hosting this. Thanking Anne and Lewis and uh, Alex, the staff, to uh, facilitate this and uh, wish you a good climate week. May we find the path forward. Thanks. Thank you.